Farley. I'm a corporate lawyer, and I've been living and breathing startups and, and well, businesses and companies uh, for probably about the last nine or ten years. A few days ago, my thought was I was going to come up here and talk to you about what is a shareholders agreement, how do you incorporate a company, how do you set up an, an, an employee stock option plan, and halfway throughout my thinking, I realized, one, how incredibly boring that would be right around this time, and also how cart before the horse that would be. Um, why am I here? I want companies to be successful, and if you're looking at it from a self-interested point of view, the better and the stronger the companies are, the more work I've got. Um, but I'm an entrepreneur myself, and so really my goal is to create companies and help support the growth uh, and have them be successful. So rather than focusing on sort of minutia and tools and details, what I wanted to do instead was focus on sort of underlying themes and things that I see when clients are approaching me that aren't very efficient, that is a waste of their time, is a waste of their money, it makes them go two steps forward, one step back, and that, that whole efficiency piece. Um, I'm a Dutch OCD Virgo, so I hate inefficiency. I <laughs> self admit it. <laughs> I hate inefficiency because I don't want to waste resources, and especially if clients are giving me money for something, I want to make sure that they're getting something in return as a value and, and sort of maximize that. So going probably down to a little bit more of a fundamental level, but I think it's really important to say these things because I see it done wrong time and time and time again. And it doesn't seem to matter how sophisticated or how experienced, it typically goes down a little bit, um, these kinds of mistakes, but they are not eliminated. So four things I wanna to talk to you about is one is educate yourself, two is have a plan, uh, attract people and keep them interested, and then uh, know the game. Educate yourself. This day and age, there's pretty much no excuse not to educate yourself around what, what type of legal structures and legal environments and business environments you're operating in. Uh, we've got our good friend, Mr. Google, that tends to be very helpful. Um, lots of great stuff to be found online, lots of terrible stuff to be found online, so I want to really emphasize that. I, I get clients and go, oh, well, you know, we're talking about this employee stock option plan, but you know what, I came home late at night and I Googled it and I'm just doing all this reading and, you know, Carly, I think you're wrong. <laughs> Love a challenge. <laughs> don't, don't mind it when people come back and, and think that I'm wrong or see something different, but um, if your sentence starts with, I Googled it, I get a little nervous. Um, there's lots of professionals and seasoned business executives and people, and especially here in Victoria, it tends to be such a nice collaborative environment. Um, like Peter was mentioning a little bit earlier, everybody here is willing to share a nugget of wisdom and give some tips. Um, so ask lots of questions, talk to people, tell them what you're doing. There's pretty much no excuse to be an ostrich in, in, in my world. Um, when you do it yourself, you get what you pay for. We've all heard that, and it's really true. Um, Part of the thing that I'm seeing when clients are coming to work with me is, well, you know, Carly, don't you just have like templates for that and you just fill on the blanks? Um, and and then that's why people think that some of the stuff they can actually do uh, do it yourself on. Um, I'd like to think I'm a little bit more than a glorified typist. Um, part of what you're typing is why are you typing it and why is it there? What goal are you trying to meet? Um, so you get what you pay for in my world. Um, and, and by the way, feel free to interrupt if you disagree with me or if you've got a question. I hate having to wait with my questions at the very end because I forget what I was going to say. So just interrupt. I don't really love hearing myself talk. So feel free to jump in or, or share with us you know, what, what you're working on right now. The second really important thing, I think, is to have a plan. So this is going to sound incredibly corny, um, but it, not having a plan around this stuff is like building a house of a foundation, and that's a corny bit. Um, when clients come to me, they'll often ask me, oh, you know, Carly, I need, I need a shareholder's agreement. I, I need an employee stock option plan. Can you just do that for me? I can, I can no problem. That's, that's awesome. I can do that for you. But I think it's more helpful to take a moment at that point in time and learn about why are you trying to do something, right? So as opposed to being this reactive process and just sort of asking your lawyer for do up a, this kind of a document, why are we trying to do that? What are we trying to do with it? Um, instead of just running around with your head cut off. Um, what are you trying to do and what key players do you need? So it's, it's scary and funny to me sometimes 
when I'm sort of halfway through a conversation with a client and we're just trying to uncover and, and the founder doesn't quite have an idea yet as to why and what it is that they're trying to do, are you trying to set up a lifestyle business? Are you trying to sell it to someone? Are you trying to be a target for someone? Are you trying to sell your technology? Like, why do you exist? Why are, why are you broke, working from your basement, <laughs> uh, eating noodles? Why are you doing that, right? There's gotta be a reason for it. Uh, and then also, how much money do you need when and how and from whom? That's the bit that gets missed. I, again, I'll get a client with, you know, I'm looking to raise $100,000. Okay, well, why? What for? From who? Why? How are you going to use it? How much of a lifespan is that going to give you? Is that going to give you six months working time? Is it going to be two months? How are you going to spend it? Where? Doing some planning around that, and, and, and I find about 50% of the time when I ask that question, like, so, so why are you raising that money? I get this sort of like, huh, that's a good question, Carly. That's a good question. Well, I'm thinking I'm going to spend... <laughs> you, you probably should have thought about it at that point. So. Part of when you're working with a lawyer, working with a professional, is those conversations need to be happening, right? Why, how much? It, it may, may not seem relevant, and I think, uh, you know, partly why people probably don't want to give more information to their advisors than not is that lots charge on the billable hour, and so every minute that you're talking, breathing in the same room, you know that the meter is kind of running. Um, but it is very relevant to know if you're going to need more money. How many investors will you want to have in your company maximum? How much money are you going to need when and how? Because it affects the early on structuring of the company. So it's important to know it now. Um, obviously, the knowing the money bit is important because if you run out of it, <laughs> it doesn't matter how awesome your idea is or how beautiful your company is or what a crazy cool idea you have. If you run out of money, you're just tough out of luck and no one's going to care. So the trick is not to run out of it um, and structuring properly and setting up your company properly at the outset and, and revisiting it sort of constantly and making sure that we're on track will help to ensure that you don't unnecessarily run out of money. It's not going to guarantee it, um, but will help. The other, uh, I think, important thing is to find ways to attract people and to keep them interested. And I would say nine times out of ten when I, when I talk to clients or prospective clients or just companies, business, whatever, about this, they think about that in terms of their customer, right? Like, how do I attract my customer? How am I going to sell? I hate the word widget. I was trying to think of another word in the car here, but I couldn't think of it. How am I going to sell my, my, my awesome good or service to the client? You know, obviously it's, it's an amazing service, so it's going to sell on its own, um, but, but that's really where the focus is at. And I don't really want to spend much time on that because that's sort of not really legal advice anymore, but, um, and this is legal information, not legal advice. Um, but what I do want to say to that is because I see it all the time is the bit that gets missed or doesn't get done early enough is, is there a pain out there and is your solution to it going to help people? Um, when I was raised up as a lawyer about nine, ten years ago, the, the, the advice that I had to give clients was the second you come up with an idea, you just run to your lawyer's office, you run to your accountant's office, and you incorporate that company, and you get all these contracts in place. Um, that is not the advice that well, I'd be giving th this day and age, and it's becoming quite old-fashioned to do it that way. Um, I like to send clients back to people like the Rob Bennetts and um, the Peter Elkinsons, and, you know, Pick up, pick up any number here of interesting people that are in the, in the room and have been in the building today, um, and you know, toss it against the wall and see if there's actually an interest, right? Are you, is there actually pain? Is there something out there? Uh, but more importantly, what I want to think about is how do you attract p people uh, like employees and like investors? So, what I have at my disposal as a corporate lawyer are a bunch of different tools to put into place your goals around that and your plans around that. But rather than looking at, okay, well, I'm going to need an employee stock option plan, let's ste step back first and figure out what we're doing and why. So if you're looking to attract and keep good people, salary, that's obviously an interesting one. People don't like to live in cardboard boxes on the side of the road. Um, and having a good working environment, those are, you know, really important. But also realizing that that stuff in your, you know, your fun pizza Fridays where you get to play video games, it only takes you so far. What other, <laughs> and I do love pizza, I really do. Uh, <laughs> what other things that can you actually put in place to 
create some incentive or to um, create sort of that ownership feel. Uh, I've been both an employee and a business owner myself, and I hate to say it, but I'm a really bad employee. Um, you know, there's, there's just sort of that work ethic that, you know, I always want to do a good job, but, you know, it's a nine to five kind of business typically, and you clock in, you clock out. How do you get employees to think about your business like it's your own? I think lots of business owners forget that bit. They think, you know, it's my baby. This is my amazing business, and naturally everyone is just going to want to just flock to me, and everyone is going to want to work here because I'm so amazing. What I'm building here is just, you know, it's just perfect. Um, and that might work for the first little bit and sort of get them through the door, but how do you keep them there? So as a lawyer, if you were to come to me and say, listen, you know, I can't really pay my staff market, or I'm having trouble attracting really good key talent, or I've got a really great group, but I just want to keep them in the game. I just want to reward them. I want to spur them on a little bit. I, I'm worried that some of, the, some of the, the people on my team are starting to create some stuff outside of my business and they're, and they're sort of doing some stuff on their own because maybe they're not making enough money or they're not feeling like what they're contributing to the company is recognized or valued. What legal tools, Carly, or pick another corporate lawyer, can we put in place to help with that? So we'd have bonus plans, we would have an employee stock option plan, we would have uh, phantom stock. There's a bunch of different things that we can put in place, but we'd have to know your, your goals and your pains first. So having that conversation to start rather than just jumping to, I've heard all these companies are getting employee stock option plans. Let's, you know, I think that's the key, that's the ticket, we gotta have that. We should stop and, and, and analyze that first. Um, then investors, you know, you obviously want to attract them, and it's, I think, part of the reason why, we're, uh, why lots of us are here today, is to attract investors, but then also keep them interested and keep them, keep them happy. Uh, how do you do that? Um, when it comes to setting up your company and your corporate structure from a legal point of view, the, the, there's a couple of different points of view around it, but the prevailing point of view is to keep it simple, stupid. Um, so you don't want to look that creative with your corporate structure. You want to be fairly boring so that when an investor looks at you and they do the due diligence, they go, yeah, got that, seen it, awesome, no worries about that. One is it avoids them having to do unnecessary work. Um, I don't know if you've ever taken a look at special rights and restrictions attached to a share class, but they can be incredibly boring to read. And so if you keep it simple, if you keep it relevant if you keep it in line with what investors are looking for and wanting you skip right through that part of the conversation you also look more serious like you're actually caring about what you're setting up here and you're not just sort of rushing to the end game of trying to sell your widget you've taken the time and the energy to set yourself up in a way that makes sense um i had a really interesting conversation uh, with uh with i guess a colleague a uh, friend a mentor and he, uh, he's a very blunt fella, <laughs> so I'll unblunt it a little bit, but um, he basically says that um, before you take money from someone else at your company, the second that you take someone else's money, you now co-own the company with someone else. And so with that comes a whole host of things. It's a little bit like getting married in you know, this decade. Um, the day and age where you know the husband would sort of come in and say, okay, well, everything's gonna go how I say it's gonna go are generally not relevant anymore. Well, the same with investors. At the moment they come in with, with money, it's their money <laughs> that, they're, that they're putting into your company. So um, I think some, with some founders and, and business owners, I see that real resistance around giving up some element of control and being held accountable. Um, but keep in mind it is their money. And, and from the sums that I'm seeing, um, perhaps they're small in the, in, you know, if you were to compare it to a Silicon Valley, but $100,000, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, so if someone is putting that into your company, they're going to have an element of say. The best solution there, uh, and that's, you know, not really a, a legal angle more than a practical, is the same as who you pick you know, as someone to, to be your life partner, make sure that their goals and their plans align with yours. Uh, having an investor come into your company is a little bit like getting married. It's really easy to get into and really hard to get out of. And if it's going badly, it's generally extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> so it's a relationship that you really wanna manage. The more aligned you are and the more alike you are and, or the more complementary your skill sets are, but your overall goal and your vision is the same, the better chance of success. Um, 
I would say about 50% of the time when a client says, you know, I've got a new investor and it's just going to be amazing, it's going to be awesome. No, you know, we know each other so well, it's going to be, just don't worry about it, you know, we really don't have to put any of these safeguards in place or anything like that. And about six months later, <laughs> I get the call with, yeah, so he's an asshole. It's not going very well. How do I get him out? Um, and so <laughs> making sure that we do this initial legwork up front, it just avoids that whole problem. Uh, you wouldn't marry the person that you just, you know, if you were to go into a coffee shop right now and you see someone sitting there, you wouldn't go off and marry them. Same with investors. I think I've beaten that horse to death. Um, date. <laughs> um, know the game as well. Um, you're in an environment as a business owner, and so you have to know the game around this. So what investors or what people that will have an interest in your company are looking for is a well-rounded team, um, but also, again, put yourself in the shoes of the investor. Um, they are going to put their money into your company. They're not Santa Claus, they are an investor. So they're looking for a return at some point in time, and there's generally a timeline associated with that, and they want a certain X return on it. Um, and so again, that goes to knowing your investor, I suppose. Um, and each type of investor is going to be looking for something different in your company. Um, Lots of questions that I get are around, well, what does an investor want? And, and the answer that I typically get back or give back is, well, it really just depends. I have seen what I would consider to be very unusual and very sort of curious requests from investors. And I've seen things where there was just really no due diligence whatsoever. And there was really no real documentation in place beyond just you know a share certificate and a check that was written. So I've seen it from the whole spectrum. Um, hard to know what the thought process is behind the no documentation. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. It's about understanding each other's expectations going in. Absolutely. And a long-term view of that. I mean, a 10, 15-year view of that. And, I, and I'm, I'm someone with a company, I've never had to bring investors in, but now I'm looking to invest in companies. And yeah. I always want to see when I talk to them, okay, so for instance, the, the simple structure you have here in, uh, you know, in British Columbia is that, okay, there's a 30% tax credit that I can enjoy. Mm -hmm. Five years, I sit quietly, I let you develop the business. Uh, year six, I want to see 50% of earnings going into dividends. Mm -hmm. I want a dividend share. That's how we're, so you'll always have money to reinvest back in the company, but I can expect a reasonable return on my investment at a certain point down the road. Um, you know, like, that, that's just an example of the kind of things that you can be very straight up at the front, like, I expect two kids and we're retiring at 50. Like, right, and I want a, and I want a boat. <laughs> Actually, I want a pony. If we're really wishing here, I want a pony. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is literally like a marriage. Like, I... I it's the closest thing that I, that I know to it. Uh, and I think they both cost about the same. <laughs> um, but it, it literally is like a marriage. Like you, if you have those conversations now, the chan it, let's say you, you speak with five or six different investors. You don't have to take their money just because it's being offered. If you feel the fit and the goal isn't there, then don't do it. Because uh, I get those, you know, I love to make money. Awesome. And, and with every corporate transaction, I make money. So that's, that's great. But I hate to make money with stupid transactions or unnecessary things or unnecessary fixes. So being clear and upfront with the investor um, and the investor in return, having those kinds of conversations, how much money are you going to need in total? Typically, there's more than one round or one, one set of investments that's needed. How much are you, are you going to need? So that the investor then knows okay, right, this is how I'm going to dilute down. Or, you know what, I don't want to dilute down. If you need more money, let's say we think you're going to need an extra 250000 over the next three years. I want to be that one to, to offer that. Having those initial conversations, it, it doesn't matter what kind of a fancy corporate document I put in place. If you don't have those conversations, it's, it's a bit of a wasted effort. And... Um, with things like shareholders agreements and, and other sort of contracts, if there's a way that you don't have to rely on them and it can just be dealt with by conversations and by just actually having a relationship with whoever is in your company and you don't have to go, well, what does the shareholders agreement in section 436 say? One, most of the time people have actually lost their shareholders agreements. Or they, you know, they're not actually riveting reads. Uh, they're hard to read. You know, even, even for a corporate lawyer, they're really 
they can be real uh, scr brain scratchers. Um, so if you could just deal with it with a conversation, it doesn't then matter what your shareholders agreement says. And I find those kinds of solutions have been just much more rewarding where it's this constant relationship between the people that are in your company. So I guess really the takeaway f that I want everyone to sort of take away is ideally you use your legal team not as someone where you just sort of knock on the door and it's like, you know, the McDonald's drive through where you just kind of order what you think it is that you need. Um, happy to give you that. Again, happy to give you a shareholders agreement, but it shouldn't be a self-serve thing or it shouldn't really be the client trying to identify what it is that they need. Um, it really should start with that overall conversation around what your goals are. Um, I was trying to get this to rhyme and it really didn't. I was very upset with that. But really, it's, it should be plans and goals and then tools. So when people, again, ask me about a shareholders agreement, that is a tool. It does something specific and it should have a purpose. So again, we need to talk about that, that tool first. And if anyone can think of a way to make that rhyme, I'd really appreciate that. I know, and I was really playing with that, but I was like, that's not good. <laughs> that, that's probably not going to work. Um, there, in, my, in my world, there's two kinds of mistakes that a business owner can make. They're the necessary mistakes, and those are good ones, right? You learn from them, they're, they're awesome, and then there's unnecessary or stupid mistakes. On fixing stuff and going back and forth on things and sort of this cart before the horse kind of an approach when you're dealing with legal or when you're dealing with your business, your company and investors is, is not a good idea. So if we can do a little bit of planning at the outset, use your lawyer for that. So have that initial conversation with your professionals, with your advisors around what your goals are and then let your professional tell you what the pros and cons, what the different tools are available to put into place and then what the pros and cons of those are. That's really my, my main message. Be smart. <laughs> Go ahead. What stage is it uh, best to like, approach you, for example? Well, um, I sort of consider the initial meeting, the initial chat, just a, hey, let's get to know you. Um, I don't really charge to have, I, I typically actually buy the coffee too, so I actually give you something. I'm very nice. <laughs> so just grabbing a coffee with me or with someone else, I mean, that. I think that should be almost right away. What I like to do for, for my planning when I'm looking at my businesses is I want to know what the different parameters are so that I can make a plan to it. So I like to speak to my accountant early. I like to speak to my lawyer early. I like to speak to, and I'm a, and I'm a great lawyer. <laughs> I've got a great lawyer myself. Um, I like to speak with my advisors, with my mentors early so I can start to sort of create a lay of the land, an overall blueprint of, okay, in one year I'm going to incorporate, or when I hit this milestone, I'm going to put an employee stock option in place. When I pick a target, I'm going to put these things in a place. I then am now able to attach some real uh, concrete items to it. I'm, I'm able to attach a budget to it. You're about to boot me off, aren't you? Oh, okay. <laughs> See the ominous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave. I will leave. <laughs> um, so I would say r right away, but don't rush to go ahead and put a structure in place right away. Um, when when I see a company that is not ready, that needs to do that, you know, throw your spaghetti against the wall and see if it sticks thing, I send them away and I, and I tell them to just report back to me. I've got a client right now that I'm doing that. Sent her away. She's about six months too early to actually have me do some work for her. But we're just having a conversation. We had a nice coffee about an hour. I bought the coffee. And then she sends me updates. Um, and then by the time you're actually ready to go, we don't have to do the whole, hi, my name is Carly. And, and then you know, having me tell you, oh, crap, had you only done this one month ago, it would have been just awesome. Ah, oh, it depends. <laughs> Sorry, what should we budget for that? It depends. I know the budget thing. So um, to, to manage expectations, most lawyers charge on the billable hour. I hate billable hours. I hate, it's like getting in a tax cab and not knowing what it's cost, gonna cost when you get out. I, I don't like surprises unless you're you know, buying something pretty. Uh, then I do like it, I guess. Um, so I actually charge on a fixed fee, but in order to charge a fixed fee, I do that legwork with you. So part of that is legwork that I do with you and the groundwork that I do is self-interested. I wanna know what I'm quoting. Um, so again, that's the initial conversations that you would have with your professional. You can get some different, you know, there's, there's a couple of easy ones like annual maintenance. It's always the same cost, right? There's a few easy ones to peg. There's a few different ballparks and, and areas, but it's uh, sort of like asking how long is a piece of string. 
So having the... Oh my goodness, 100,000, let's talk. <laughs> We're going to get along just fine. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Retirement and pony, here I come. <laughs> um, having just, you know what, honestly, it's a very specific thing that is, that is sort of tailored to the particular need and where you're at. So throwing a quote out here would be like suicide. A little rope would come down and it's not a good idea. So having those initial conversations, those don't cost anything. Then you know the lay of the land and then we can actually quote to something that's reasonable and accurate. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is a question, but it's most uh, entrepreneurs only start once or twice. So they don't really have the experience to be able to know what it is that they must do. So um, that's why I say I'm not sure if it's a question. I think that's what you're really saying is that there's a, a discussion and there can be guidance given by yourself in the initial stages to say, you know, these are the sort of milestones that you will need to cover, whether they happen now or at different times, that's debatable. But um, I think from even my own experiences, um, you know, it's a minefield and knowing what it is that, that where those minds are placed is, is the trick. And, and an entrepreneur maybe only does it once, as I say, won't know where those minds are. Yeah, and, and I definitely agree. Um, and I don't like to sort of start from the fear-mongering position of, uh, you know, it is a minefield, and, and that's, that's true, I suppose, so it's also really exciting. Um, I have found that people are very willing and happy to share sort of initial foundation knowledge, their experience, their story. Most people generally like to talk about themselves, so that's a great sp spot to start. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it can be a, a lonely place if you've never uh, ran a business before. Uh, your friends and family are probably the worst to go to for advice because they'll just sort of tell you that you're amazing and keep going and yes, totally I'd buy your service. Uh, not good feedback typically. Um, you're going to get more honest feedback from people that are not interested and not in your inner circle. Um, so getting that, uh, sharing also with other, it sounds again really corny, that sort of kumbaya stuff, but um, sharing with other entrepreneurs as well that are in the same boat, they may have learned a few things. But as well, keep in mind, one, one thing that I do see quite frequently is, oh, so-and-so is doing an A, B, and C, or so-and-so is putting in a shareholders agreement, I should have that too. The tools and the things that you actually end up going with are very specific to you and to your business. So what works for someone else doesn't always work for you. So I don't just want everybody blindingly going to copy everybody else. And you know, if everybody else is doing it, it's got to be amazing. Um, so that's the only thing I'd sort of add to that is be cognizant of the fact that equal treatment is an identical treatment. Is that how it goes? Yeah. So. Thank you very much. I'm going to stick. Thing oh. That's important for everyone at this stage to hear in the room is that your contracts, your, your corporation, your administrative setup, legal costs are X. Conflict is 10X. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's, you know, that's the, 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 the that's stupid money earning thing. Yeah, and it's not going to 100% eliminate it. You know, I can, I can eliminate all of your business risk right now. Stop running your business. <laughs> you know, that's, got it, nailed it. So there's going to be an element of risk, and we, and we just have to appreciate that. But again, it's, for me, I call those stupid mistakes and smart mistakes. Stupid mistakes are just so not necessary. They hog your time. Fixing it is a nightmare half the time. Uh, I, by that time, you might have other people in your company. You're not going to need their sign off. It's just, it's just not worth it in the long run. Um, that being said, when you are putting something like a legal structure in place, there are also different ways to phase that in. So it's not like you have to go with the full kit and caboodle right at the outset. If you get the full kit and caboodle, your risk goes down, but your cost goes up, and then those two lines kind of, you know, pass each other at some point. That's also a discussion that you can and should be having with your advisors is, listen, this is where I'm at with my company right now. Love to have the full kit and caboodle, but you know my budget is X. What can we do for X? There is, there are. Th it's not an all or nothing proposition. There are different things that you can do to phase in so that you're not spending a disproportional amount on legal or accounting, where it doesn't quite match your business yet. So, that's again, I guess, tying back into your question: How early should you have that first conversation early? And then maybe I, you know, we decide, okay, a month in, we're going to do this one very minor, minor thing. I'm going to give you a little NDA, so when you have a chat with people, then 
you know, they don't take your confidential information and start their own thing. There might be a few little things that we can sort of phase in that are cost effective. So thank you so much for having me, really appreciate it. I'm gonna stick around for a little bit. Um, and I also had some notes written down that um, I think you, know, you, can, you can share if, if people want. So awesome, thank you so much.